Welcome everyone. Welcome back to our Saturday morning ongoing class on the, Gos the Gnostic Gospels. And we are currently, as you know, going through the tractate. Hang on. Of course, I, I didn't mark my place last week. We're going through the tripartite tractate, as you know, and have been for some time now. Um, it's a long, very well worth it Gnostic Gospel. And uh, we've been, as you also know, uh, studying it very thoroughly, deeply. And we're getting close to the end of it. Close, but not yet there. Close, but not yet there. Uh -oh. <laughs> Boy, we've covered a lot. Now, let's take up with where we left off. Because we left off at a very important cliffhanger. The tripartite tractate says, what has come from the race of the Hebrews and what is written by the Hylix who speak in the fashion of the Greeks are the powers of those who think of attributing them to the, to the right hand powers which move them all to think of words and images for them and they grasped so as to maintain the truth Ta-da! Do you hear what that's saying? Do you hear what that's saying? It is, the Gnostic Gospel is here acknowledging its debt to the Hebrews, to the Jews, and to the Hellenist Jews. Again, what has come from the race of the Hebrews. Notice also, they are being, we are being called a race. I must point out, as clearly as I can, up until the Nazi Holocaust, we Jews had no trouble whatsoever calling ourselves and preferring to be called a race. Not just a religion, but a race. It was because Hitler called us a race and exterminated or attempted to exterminate us that it fell vastly out of, out of fashion to refer to ourselves as a race or to have others refer to us as a race. But we have always considered ourselves and been considered by others to be a race. Matter of fact, I had a dream last night where I was explaining this to someone. That's amazing. That's just amazing. I just just remembered. Seriously. Where I'm talking to someone in my dream about the Jewish genome. Now the thing of the Jewish genome that's been discovered, I would point out, as a result of the genome study for the past 30, 40 years, is that that marker is only found in Jews. Not all who identify themselves as Jews, because not everyone who claims to be a Jew is. Do you understand what I'm saying? So there is an absolutely genetic DNA marker that identifies the Jewish people as a race. Now, that is a race that may or may not follow the Jewish religion. But unfortunately, Hitler was correct. We Jews are not just a religion. We are a race. One can be a Jew and not practice the Jewish religion. One can be a Jew and not be Jewish. And indeed, I was explaining all this, as I said, in a dream just last night. And here we see it. Here we see it 
in the Gnostic Gospels. What has come from the race of the Hebrews and what is written by Hylix who speak in the fashion of the Greeks, that is to say, the Hellenistic Jews, the Hellenistic Hebrews, are the powers of those who think of attributing them to the right-hand powers, powers which move them all to think of words and images for them. And they grasped them so as to retain the truth. Notice it says not just words, but images, that is to say, the inner images, the archetypes. Again, I have to point out for all of you here and for all of you listening later in the recording on the Dumbo West website and on Facebook, the tripartite tractate of the Gnostic Gospels of the Nag Hammadi Library is clearly stating the indebtedness of the Christian Gnostics to the Jewish mystics who came before them. How many of you can see that? Raise your hand. Now, you may be thinking, why the hell is he making such a big deal of this? And it is because Gnostics don't want to admit that. Some Jews, even Jewish scholars, don't want to admit that. They want to see Jewish mysticism as growing out of Gnosticism, which is ridiculous. Not the other way around, that much of Gnosticism grew out of the pre-Gnostic Jewish mysticism. And here we see that confirmed clearly, boldly, in this statement of the Zohar. It even says by the practices of the Gnostic Hebrews, images were called forth. Images. They experienced God directly, visually. It goes on also, other men of the Hebrew race, of whom we already spoke, namely the righteous ones, and the prophets did not think of anything and did not say anything from imagination or from analogy or from esoteric thinking, but each one by the power which was at work in them and while listening to the things which he saw and heard spoke of them in faith. Hashem. This acknowledges the righteous ones of the Jews, the tzaddikim of the Jews, the enlightened ones of the Jews. It acknowledges them and says that they didn't just make everything up. They were speaking, it's saying here, from direct experience of the powers that they were describing. But each one of the righteous ones, by the power which was at work in him, described the images. And while listening to the things which he saw and heard, spoke of them in faith. I really, I, I must, huh, I must uh, post that. on Facebook. How many of you understand the tremendous significance of this? Raise your hands. It's just, it's just tremendous. Now it's also true that m some of the Gnostic Gospels would appear to be, it's called anti-Semitic. They are not anti-Semitic. They're doing what the Quran does. They are criticizing those Jews who do not do this. The exoteric Jews. But that doesn't make it anti-Semitic. The Gnostic Gospels also criticize the Christians of the time. They also criticize the Christians of the time. 
So it's not anti-Semitic, but we see a strong statement. I'm going to reread it. It's so important. Of the debt of, of the Gnostics to pre-Gnostic Hebrew esotericism. It says, what has come from the race of the Hebrews and what is written by the Hylics who speak in the fashion of the Greeks are the powers of those who think of attributing them to the right, to powers which moved them all. They used the confused powers which act in them. Afterwards, they attained them to order of the unmixed and the one who is established the unity who exists in the image of the Father's image. Notice it is saying exactly what we say Kabbalah is about. It is saying that these Hebrews took what was disunified in God and reunified it in God. <laughs> oh my God. I'm almost floored. How many of you hear that added information that the Hebrews took what is disunified, what was disunified, and reunified it through their own esotericism, which found its way into Gnosticism? They used the confused powers which act in them. Afterwards, they attain to the order of the unmixed, the one who is established, the unity who exists in the image of the Father's image. They took what was mixed and confused and made it unmixed and unconfused, a unity. The Father's image, he is not invisible in his nature. But a wisdom envelops him so that he might preserve the form of the truly invisible one. Again, if you remember the Zohar, it talks about knowing God at the gate. It says no one ever has known God or seen him or ever will. But God is knowable at the gate of the tent that covers him. That's what's being referred to here. Referring to the oral Torah of the Zohar, not the written five volumes of the Zohar, but the Zohar existed in oral form and oral tradition at the time of the Gnostics and even before them. Therefore, many angels have not been able to see God. Also, other men of the Hebrew race of whom we already spoke, namely the righteous ones and the prophets, did not think of anything and did not say anything from just analogy or thinking. But each one said and experienced what they did by the power which was at work in them. And they did this in true faith. It goes on. Having a unified agreement with one another and the manner of those who work in them, they, the Hebrew race, preserve the connection and the mutual agreement primarily by the confession of the one more exalted than they. And there is one who is greater than they who was appointed since they have need of him, begotten by the spiritual Logos along with them as one who needs the exalted one begotten in hope and the expectation in order with the thought which is the seed of salvation. And he is an illuminating word which consists of the thought and his offsprings and his emanations. 
It's referring to the Christ. And, even more specifically, to the Christ as it became incarnate in the man Yeshua Anatri. <clears throat> but you'll notice it's not attributing divinity to Yeshua Hanatsri. It is, however, saying that the Messiah, Yeshua Hanatsri, was an incarnation of the holy powers within the righteous of the Hebrew race. Not the Greeks, not the Asians, not the blacks, but the Hebrew race. Since the just ones and the prophets, whom we have previously mentioned, preserve the confession and the testimony concerning the one who is great, made by their fathers, who were looking for the hope and the hearing in his own, the seed of prayer and the searching, which is sown in many who have searched for strengthening. It appears and draws to them love and the exalted one. This is saying exactly what Carl Gustav Jung said many, many, many centuries later. The continuing incarnation of God. The incarnation in Yeshua Hanatsri is the first of many succeeding incarnations of the righteous who seek to unify God. Listen, this is almost like a primer of Neo-Sabbatean Kabbalah. And it was a unity which worked in them when they spoke the Hebrew righteous, the Hebrew tzaddikim, the saints, the Hebrew saints. Every Gnostic, I think, should read this passage. And it was a unity which worked in them when they spoke. Their vision and their words do not differ because of the multitude of those who have given them the vision and the word. It's saying the Hebrew tzaddikim heard and saw and experienced the same holy images as the Gentile Gnostics later did because all of those are coming from the same place. That is the collective unconscious. Oh, I'm going to stop here uh, for this morning. This is just uh, too much. <laughs> I'm going to stop here. Let me take down your hands. And let me ask for comments, questions, feedback, Reactions, raise your hand if you have any. Yeshai, go ahead. Yisod, there you go. Thank you, Yisod. Go right ahead. Here we go. Yisod says, kick ass supernova exegesis felt like driving spikes into the railroad tracks of the Almighty. There is a whole lot of power contained in this morning's text, covered lots of ground, and brings confirmation of what we study in these Gnostic texts and how we and it are intertwined in them for God's sake. Alleluia, Isot. Alleluia. Yeshai, go ahead. Anyone else? Dr. Shazer, Ilan, anything you wanted to say? In the meantime, Yeshai, go ahead, say what you wanted to say. Waiting for Yeshai. Come out, you shy, waiting. Remember, you shy, keep it short and pithy, just like you just did. Korea slamming, dance of intensity, not just giving respect, but vetting and hailing of the Jewish saints among the Jewish roots of Gnosticism. Very well said. Thank you. 
All right, we'll start. Our, oops, didn't mean to red dot you. We'll start um, a little earlier in the next class than usual, and will with each class today. I have men coming to do work around the house, and I want to be sure and uh, have classes finished by the time they arrive. So uh, we'll begin our next class at quarter past the hour, 9.15 AM, OK? 9.15 AM, and that class will be 138 openings of wisdom. God bless you all. See you all.